Wanderers lay one egg, and if all goes well, they raise one chick every two years. Perhaps it's seen enough for one day, because the immature bird, maybe six or seven years old, it'll be ten before it breeds, the immature bird decides it's time to take off and go fishing. Long, narrow wings, the wings of an accomplished endurance glider. That was the end of our stay on the fabulous island of South Georgia. It was time to rejoin the ship and get underway on our journey further south to the very edge of Antarctica. It's true that to get there, you must run the gauntlet of the Southern Ocean, but that's awash with wonderful petrels. And as you begin to punch your way through the endless westerlies, especially while you're still in the 50 latitudes, there's a chance of a magical happening. Lean over the side of the ship, and there, chasing the bow wave, are dolphins. Go up into the eyes of the ship and lean over the stem and see them riding the bow wave. Sometimes alone, sometimes in dozens. Thomason's dolphin. It was in these very waters in 1767, as they reached towards Tierra del Fuego, that Philibert Comesson, sailing with Louis de Bougainville, first recorded them for science. Strikingly marked dolphins, fast swimmers and fearless ship riders. Comesson's dolphin. Heading south and out into the wild waters of the Southern Ocean, that's where we're joined by the greatest seabird in the world, the wandering albatross. Nearly 12 feet in wingspan, a master glider, soaring in the endless westerlies, looking for squid. And here, out in the vasty deep, the tiniest of ocean-going birds dances over the waves with its white rump, like a sea-going house martin. Wilson's storm petrel walks the waters for gobbets of greasy plankton. Perhaps the commonest bird in the world, yet you must go to deep southern latitudes for the best experiences of it. Very few have seen it. It's tiny compared with the great albatrosses. giant petrel. Over the misty ocean, the white morph, which is never common, but easier to find the further south we go. And the occasional southern fulmar. Now the skipper's view from the wheelhouse window changes character in a most profound way. It's colder and we find ourselves heading towards the ice. Yeah, it is 
Open pack. The water temperature here is minus four degrees Celsius. The surface freezes and forms into flows. The Pintados cluster in the wake. And now, as we penetrate the deep south, the albatrosses are left behind. In these relatively calm waters, there's not enough wind to support them. But the giant petrels and the Pintados remain. These seabirds follow the ship because it creates useful and enjoyable airwaves, but also because its very passage churns up the plankton and brings choice titbits to the surface. It's while we're amongst the ice that we have the best chance of a glimpse of the most magical of all the petrels. The virgin white snow petrel. Almost always associated with ice and most difficult to get a good look at it, it floats around like a snow white bat, perfectly camouflaged in a world of snow and ice. These are the high southern latitudes where tabular icebergs are torn from the great Antarctic ice shelves to float majestically on the roundabout of the Weddell Sea. And now we've reached the first of the islands of the Antarctic Peninsula, volcanic islands, the home of vast numbers of seabirds, penguins, petrels, post-breeding concentrations of fur seals and elephant seals, killer whales and humpback whales. Sheltered anchorages in places like this, Whalers Bay and Deception Island, brought first sealers, then whalers. The remains of a Norwegian whaling station bears witness to the carnage which went on into the 1930s. Today, the kelp gulls nest on top of the rusting boilers. It looks peaceful enough, but deception has erupted several times in the last few decades. Hot springs steam away constantly at the edge of the water. We tracked the steep volcanic slope in search of the nesting place of the Pintados, the Cape Petrels, birds which always seem to be the prime favorites of Antarctic explorers. They make their homes much as their former relatives do, an unlined nest on an exposed cliff ledge, a single egg incubated in the hope that the weather will be kind till the chick takes off. And when the weather is kind, the Antarctic scenery is magnificent. Sailing between the islands and the icy waterways, disturbing the sleeping crab-eater seals as we pass, there's always something to catch the eye. These are waters where there's the chance of a killer whale or a humpback. Sometimes the humpbacks are very active in lunge feeding, but this group of three is socializing, relaxing. There's a splendid view of the diagnostic feature, the hump just ahead of the tiny dorsal fin. Massive creatures, maybe over 50 feet in length and weighing nearly 50 tons, knobbly headed with curious tuberosities. It's one of the many excitements of an Antarctic trip. But I suppose every Antarctic visitor is desperate to see penguins and no one is disappointed. I guess everyone's favorite is the Adélie penguin, the quintessential penguin in evening dress, on an ice floe just off the beach and ready to come ashore. Coming ashore to make their way up the beach 
towards the colonial nesting site. Earlier in the year, they may have had to trudge over miles of sea ice. Now, the water is open, and they haven't far to go. Like all birds, they need to drink fresh water, and sometimes it's easiest to melt a beak full of ice. Adelie colonies are spread out over a rocky slope, each nest a comfortable packing distance away from the neighbours. A nest of small stones, painstakingly assembled and serving to keep the precious eggs above any meltwater. Here, on Paulette Island, there's a massive colony of many thousands of birds. They've even colonised the remains of a historic hut. Nearly a hundred years ago, the crew of the explorer Otto Nordenschult had to abandon ship and overwinter here. Killing a couple of thousand penguins, 22 men built this little hut and survived the darkness of an Antarctic winter. Now, the Adelis take advantage of a bit of height and nest on the shattered walls. Incubating two eggs, insulated from the fearful cold tucked up inside the brood patch. Hatch after a month or so to peep out and explore the world. It'll be a couple of weeks before it joins the communal creche. On Paulette, we found a rare example of a coffee-coloured Adélie. I've seen them occasionally amongst chin straps and gentoos, but this was the first Isabelline Adélie that I've seen. The truly white albinos are very much rarer. I think it looks a bit sad, but that's probably just imagination. They don't seem to suffer any disadvantage. Even in summer, there's always plenty of ice, bergy bits, ice flows, icebergs. And the ship clatters and clanks, breaking the flows and the bergy bits as she threads her way through narrow channels. The water is glassy calm, like a mirror. This is Penguin Island, and not surprisingly, it's home to a lot of penguins. Off-duty birds lounging about on the beach, and lone birds moving with high purpose on the way back to the happy home for important business. Chinstrap penguins are sociable animals. They build their stone piles at a discreet distance from the neighbour, but they live in a close-knit community usually up a bit from the beach. And when our bird gets back to the nest, there's a noisy greeting ceremony. That's his mate on the right. She's been incubating the egg, and it's time for a change of shift. But she's not at all sure she wants to give up yet. Not before a bit more discussion. He knows the egg is there. He wants to take over and settle down. She is still reluctant to give up. After another exchange of views, they both agree the time has come to perform the ritual of changeover, and the new shift takes over responsibility for incubation.
and the off-duty parent departs for a period of rest and recreation. While the egg is carefully tended, safe from the attentions of marauding skewers, the off-duty bird trudges away in search of the sort of peace and quiet which is hard to find in the middle of a penguin colony. In this case, there's a small meltwater pond not far away, ideal place for a bathe and the inevitable preening session which follows. Apart from the occasional foul weather and the marauding skewers and the leopard seals and the killer whales, a penguin's life is a jolly one. And it's impossible not to be thoroughly anthropomorphic in describing it. They really are awfully like little people. The Antarctic is a wild place, a harsh environment, the coldest and windiest place on Earth. But often enough, it can be awesomely beautiful. <laughs> 